We can commence to get ready to start the final meeting of the year of the Budget and Finance Committee. The, uh, uh, if you are ready to go, Mrs. Cole, maybe you could present your report. And we'll go with item number one after the rest. Well, Terry. Um, thanks. What, um, what I've had handed out to you is um, um, a draft of our November revenue because, um, because you all are meeting so much earlier in the month um, for this meeting. We haven't closed November yet, so there's still, especially on the expenditure side, there's still some work to do. Um, but, but I did want to go ahead and give you a heads up on the revenue. Um, we also have copies of the October report coming to you, which um, I think you didn't get because the last budget finance meeting I wasn't on the agenda and we didn't do an October report. So, but for November, um, I, I guess many of you may have seen the article this weekend about, uh, about the October revenue. And um, actually, um, I, I said um, when I was speaking to Michelle Koo about that, that um, November could could be very confusing for us, and and it is very confusing on a positive note. Um, it we are up in employee withholdings, net profits, and insurance. The report you have in front of you shows us down in franchise fees, but we have discovered that there was a timing. A um, couple big checks came in on December one and two that were postmarked the thirtieth, and had they gotten here on time would have been November 30th. So actually, if you add those checks in, we're ahead in franchise fees also for November. Now that said, <laughs> I, I don't think this means by any form or fashion that we are out of the woods. Um, we've been waiting for some of the timing differences to work themselves out because some of the three payroll issues that we talked about in prior months. Um, but. Uh, we also have been examining some um, national indicators against some of our um, revenue to, to kind of see where we fall out. And, and there are some fairly clear indications that we do follow the national um, indicators. We lag a bit. And our and our and and our declines or flattenings are not nearly as severe as you see in the national numbers. So um, right now, through November, you would have to say that um, we have we're not in a decline. Um, I, I don't I don't know what December brings, and I, I wish I had a crystal ball. I wish I could say to you. You know, this is all going to be just fine, but we don't know yet where the bottom is at the national level. And um, so we don't know how severe things are really going to get there, and therefore we can't even begin to think about what it's going to be for us. Now, what we know, regardless of what happens in 2009, is that we have a problem going into 2010 that um, it is going to be very difficult for us. Um, we've said that before. But I have to tell you, I think in the last couple budgets we've put together, uh, the council and the mayor, we have um, we've picked a lot of low-hanging fruit, and there's not much more fruit on that tree to pick. We um, we are we're down in the number of employees um, across government. Um, we in the 08 budget we cut back by 10 percent. We have asked division directors to cut another annualized 5 percent, beginning right now. Um, so we are doing everything we can to manage our way through 09, and, and I think we're going to be able to do that. But, but anything that we can come up with in 09 softens a bit what we might have to deal with in 2010. In 2010, we're going to be looking at increased um, contributions to CERS and to CERS hazardous for, the, for our employees. Um, we're going to have some added debt service because we've, we will have sold the 2007, 2008, and 2009 nine bonds that have already been approved by council. So that will be new, new debt service um, in 2010. All of that with the police and fire contracts and the, and the corrections contracts, we're looking at an 18 to $20 million hole. 
and that assumes that we haven't done anything yet with the police and fire retirement fund, which, as you know, um, it is, is a huge issue for us. If um, um, I, th I think you may have already received the message that the mayor put together on, on that. We are proposing um, an inter a, a solution to that problem. But anything we do um, is, is, is going to affect us in 2010. Um, so with that, I guess I'll just um, I'll, I'll ask if there are any questions. What you have before you uh, are the charts, the, the revenue charts that we've given you before. I think they're, they're um, a little helpful to kind of see where we stack up against prior years. Um, not quite sure how much more detail you want. I have a lot more information if you'd like to get into it. But um, Well, it's encouraging to have a little uptick, it looks like. Absolutely. At least it's sustained with our budget predictions. And they may not be as bleak. They haven't been as bleak yet as the storm clouds you described for old, for 10. Right. But uh, you said you had a handout for October? Uh, uh, yes, the October ones are here. Okay. Yeah, that'd be fine. Maybe I'll we can one, take a look at that and discuss it while we're on this topic. Right. Well, what you will see in, in October is, is not positive, which is why we're a little hesitant about what's happened in November is because in December, if you look at December, I mean in October, October 08 compared to October 07, um, we're down about 9 percent. So, um, but that, now that's in all revenue and all you have before you for November is the big four. So let's, we're not comparing apples to apples here. Um, all we have for you for November right now is it's the big four, and that's because we keep it in a different way than we keep the rest of the revenue. So you're you're saying that the October revenue report showed this to be down 9.2 percent. Yes, sir. I guess I read about that in the paper too. Yes, and and I apologize that you didn't get that report. Um, you should have had it before it hit the paper. Well, um, Michelle sorry. usually keeps everything pretty accurate, so. Michelle and I have worked very well together over the last week or so. We've spent a lot of time together talking about these things. The, uh, but I don't understand if we were 9% down, it looked like we were 15% down with withholding insurance fees and franchises. But now we're, with your November report, we're back on schedule. Okay. We are, but let's remember one of the things that we had talked about really since July is that October is a three pay period month. And we were expecting, especially in employee withholdings, for everything to kind of um, line up for us with the November withholdings because of the October, three October pay, pay periods. So that, that was a timing difference that we were expecting. There were three pay periods in July of 07, three pay periods in October of 07, so it was November before we really are getting a year-to-date that um, is apples to apples in uh, employee withholdings. So you say because of timing, the October report wasn't a true reflection of our uh, Yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's what we would have said had, uh, and I mean, I began saying that in September, but had I given an October report, it would have been that, that we had to be really cautious because we have this three pay period month, we had that three pay period month coming up. Okay, are there questions uh, regarding these? Uh, uh, Mr. Ellinger, I think is first, and yes. Mr. Beard. Thank you, um, Dr. Stevens. Yeah, I guess I want to first start out saying I was a little disturbed and I'm curious why we didn't receive this and I have to read about it in the newspaper. I guess that was Well, really I apologize for that, but I, I will remind you, too, that I wasn't on the agenda for your for your um, November meeting. Well, I guess I would like to have been sent something because when when you're a council person and, and you don't read something in the paper right away and you go out and somebody stops you on the street and says, what's going on here, and they know as much or more about it than you do, then it, it makes it difficult for us to do our job. I apologize. So I think if you're going to send the Herald Leader something, you I should didn't send it. Let's, we should, let's make sure that we have all the information they're going to have, too, if you don't okay. mind. I'd, I'd be happy to, but I need to make it clear that I didn't just send something to the Herald Leader. The Herald Leader requested the information, and I provided That's fine, it. I'm but sorry. Okay. I think I, in the future, I let's, thank you. And I guess now my question goes to 
we, I guess, have now been considered we're in a recession nationwide. We, we usually do lag nationwide. We see what's going on with the state and where they've had economists come in and talk about what they're going to do. I guess I'd like to know what our contingencies are. I know you say that we're actually coming in at least November is better than we expected, and we're at least 09 look like, I think you used the word, that we can manage 09. That's right. What are we looking at, though, because I know the state's got some – proposals out there. What are our proposals? I know I read an email or a, from the mayor today on some contingencies, but what are we planning on doing that we can manage for 09 and then for 10? Because I think we have to be proactive here because we don't want to come in and then January, December, January, where we come back off a break and then we find out that it's coming in a lot worse because we are behind a little on the the um, national lag, because obviously when you look at today, Sony, 16,000 jobs are being cut. So every day there's more and more 533,000 national jobs last month. So obviously when we're based on the, um, the payroll tax, there's going to be some, some effect that's going to happen to Lexington. Where are we and how are we going to be prepared for that? And what do we as a council need to be doing to be prepared for that? How are retirees coming in? Because that was put into this budget. Where are we and what do we need to do to be prepared for this lag that's going to happen that is seeing when you look at the um, automakers up there right now on Capitol Hill asking for money, we've got bailouts. What are we doing to make sure that we're going to be ready for it when it does hit us? Um, well, first of all, I would say that um, um, we have been carefully reviewing um, um, new hires to government over the last, really, 18 months, and we're, we're down about 190 positions across government, full-time positions, since December 2006. Um, so, so we have been very cautious about hiring. Um, we, and on the personnel side, um, uh, a freeze is in effect other than those jobs that the mayor deems to be absolutely necessary. Um, we have asked division directors to begin reducing their budgets by 5 percent. We're targeting some specific areas in the budget that we know if we need to, we can, we can kind of slow down the spending. There's some money in the budget for debt service that's not going to be needed because, because of the timing of the sale of our bonds. So there, there are some mechanisms available to us, um, assuming just that the bottom doesn't fall out. Now, I, I can tell you we, we've looked at any number of, of different kinds of things, but when you don't know how severe it's going to be, all you can do is kind of talk about these things and, and be ready and know what the consequences are as you move forward. But, but um, in, in terms of specific things, I would say the freeze and the 5 percent reduction in operating. And I would remind you that that's on top, for most divisions, that's on top of a 10 percent reduction that's already in the 08 budget. So that operating in, in some places has to be getting just very, very tough. I see in the state when I read about it that they've looked at potential what's going to happen on um, revenue, revenues that are going to be not, um, I think they said almost a half a billion dollars that are going to be shortfall. Do we know what ours are going to be? Can we calculate that? Have we done any of that to, to be prepared for that? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't understand well, your question. Well, I think um, they, they had the, uh, Frankfurt has gone through, had economists looked at what the shortfall is going to be okay. for this fiscal year. Have we done that to think, you know, at forecasting what we, I know we've, we've got what came in November, we're kind of hoping that it's, it's trending the same way, but have we been looking at the best case scenario, middle case scenario, and the worst case scenario on what we need to do? And do we have, have we received anything about that, what our policy that if we have to do some um, calculating and changing what's going to happen? I, I guess maybe I misunderstand the process, but yes, internally we have been looking at scenarios for, for months now, and, and I assumed that the process would be once we have made a firm calculation of what we think the revenue is going to be, if it's lower than is budgeted, we will be bringing that to you in the form of a budget amendment that would decrease revenue and decrease expenditures. So um, un until we are to the point that we will absolutely say we're not going to make budget, we're going to be doing things internally like cutting back on operating and, and, and those kinds of things. So. If, if I'm supposed to be doing something other than that. Well, I think, I think you just see from the national trend, the state trend, 
it's going to it's going to hit us. It just how how long down the cycle is it going to happen? So I just want to make sure that we're not sitting here thinking, well, it's it's November. We're still doing well, so we don't have to worry about it. I want to make sure that we have plans in effect that if we have to do something that we're not going to be after the fact saying, well, boy, I wish we had planned on this because I didn't see it coming because we all are seeing it coming. Let's make sure we're ahead of the eight ball than behind it at the six months down the road. And I guess I'd like to know from as a council member where we are looking at because I read about it from the national level and from the state level. I'm just not seeing as much of it here in the local level, which I would like to know a little more. Okay. If we have percentages that we think that if it's not going to come in this, this, and this, this is what our contingencies are going to be for that. Um, I, can, I can assure you we will be prepared now. Um, I am not prepared to, to share with you details of everything that we've discussed because, as you know, in government, if somebody utters the word, it becomes gospel. And, and, and quite frankly, I don't think we're in a position yet to... Um, to, to start assuming that certain things will happen when we, we don't know, we, we don't know how far it's going to be off or when. So what we're looking at right now is, is trying to position ourselves to end 2009 with a comfortable cushion so that we can, we can buffer a little bit of, of 2010. That's the, that's the plan right now. And some of those things that I just mentioned, the hiring freeze, the reduction in operating expenses and the debt service that's been identified are those things that that um, we will be pulling the trigger on. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, Mr. Beard. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a couple of things, Commissioner. <clears throat> this time last year, I guess, or maybe even before, we talked about retirees, anticipated retirees. And we're at a point now where we ought to know who those folks are and how many there are. So what is that? Yes, sir. Um, we had budgeted for 170, and what we have reported to us as of last Friday was 107. Okay. And, and we have been providing those numbers to council staff, so. Uh, the, the second. Some council staff. <laughs> let, me, um, let me clarify. Not, not all of council staff, so. Um, you know, in national elections especially, uh, the major networks take a pretty good guess at who the winner is and what states are going to be carried and, and, and that type of thing through exit polls and, and uh, certain precincts that always perform according to uh, one way or another consistently. Is there any way that we could do a similar thing? Maybe I should be asking Bill this because it's probably going to be Bill and Jim that are doing it. But anyway. Um, where we can pick the 10 top employers. And um, this question about the franchise fee uh, and do a pseudo pro forma of what it should look like, not what it does look like on a cash basis, but what it should look like. And it's not a gospel thing, we understand, but it, it at least smooths out some of these dips and, and bubbles that we we always, it seems like every other meeting, we've got a, a dip or a bubble, and uh, right. we're bouncing ourselves around, and you never, you're never in a good mood because you never know what, <laughs> what to trust. Well, yeah, let, let me say, as happy as I am by where we are in November, I am incredibly frustrated, and I would expect you all to be frustrated. The mayor's frustrated. We, we don't, I mean, we just don't know. Now, we are staying in very close touch with some folks at UK who have been incredibly helpful. In, in guiding us to the kinds of indicators that we ought to be looking at and, and, and that kind of thing. The problem is that much of the national information is, is delayed by a few months. Well, a few months, then something drastic could have already happened, and, and, and so we're, we're struggling a little bit with timing. But I can assure you that Bill and his staff and, um, and Jim Deaton and Mary, the whole crew, I mean, we are – meeting more than once a week to sit down and talk about what the possible scenarios could be and timing that we all are aware of, things that might be different. So we are, we are almost, we are weekly looking out on, on, for projections. I'm just trying to 
maybe slightly formalize that process a little bit more with, with some swag entries that uh, could be made, and you can do it on the back of an envelope if you want to, to make it uh, unofficial looking. <laughs> but it just would make some of us feel maybe a little bit better about uh, how you perceive that we're doing. Um, one other thing which uh, um, Council Member Ellinger mentioned, and I might point out, um, when we lag behind the rest of the country on a downturn, that doesn't mean we have to catch up with them at some point no. before we start up. We'll start up sooner, just like we started down later. And um, that's a big plus for our economy uh, in, in central Kentucky, actually. So there was some good news today, whether uh, <coughs> the stock market reacts to it or not, but supposedly uh, uh, last month the foreclosures in the United States bottomed out and they're starting, uh, they're starting to uh, lessen. And uh, <coughs> that doesn't mean that there aren't still foreclosures, however. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ed Lane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first thing I, I wanted to mention is I'm an advocate of monthly budgeting, and I know that would, we've been discussing this ongoing. I know you're working towards trying to do that next year. But if we did monthly budgeting of uh, revenues as well as expenses, you know, we could make some estimates like when we have three payroll in one month versus two payrolls, and we'd be able to make some calculations about revenues. This would take you know, some of the... Um, question marks out of the, the revenue fluctuation. Well, well, in fact, what's in front of you does have a monthly budget. I beg your pardon? No, no, the, but the I understand, in front but I'm just saying for, we do our budget for the entire year, we would estimate revenues on a monthly basis and maybe adjust it for the number of pay cycles within each We've month. done that. Okay. That, we, we have done that. Well, I know, but you haven't given me those numbers. I, then. I, I, it's on this report right here, budget. Well, I understand, but I'm talking about for the whole year. You know, you oh, to okay. Month by month. Okay, I'm sorry. It would be I helpful to see it on, a, on an annualized basis. Oh, okay. We, so we I'd be happy a, to give you that. We have that. You know, for our budgeting, and then we could put those into our annual plan. Perhaps. Sure. I, I just wanted to mention that. However, I, I wanted to um, say something positive about <laughs> our economy, uh, and, I, and I think we, feel, we should feel very lucky. First off... I reviewed the uh, employment levels in Fayette County for September of this year versus last year, and we're somewhere around 500 more people working in Fayette County uh, versus, uh, say, in Jefferson County, which has had a 4,800 job decline, as if I recall these numbers accurately. So we are very fortunate that we have created more jobs. Uh, also, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the state right now which uh, means people are working and they're paying uh, their payroll taxes. Uh, the other thing that we have going is we have a lot of capital improvements being made in our, in our general uh, central Kentucky area. And just a few of them, the UK Med Center is $532 million investment. The pharmacy school is around $135 million. Uh, we're expanding the live animal diagnostic center up on Newtown Pike. I think that's about $20 million. Um, Kentucky American Water Company is running their pipeline and building their plant. Some of that's outside of central Kentucky, our immediate area. That's a $168 million investment. The center point is a $250 million development in downtown. Um, the horse park is building two arenas, which I believe have a combined capital expenditure of around $60 million. And then there's been a number of roads that have been constructed in the last year or so, plus we're doing a lot of improvements around the horse park on the interstates, which is also, you know, bringing capital investment in. And, and then finally, you know, we are working on our emergency operations center, which if that goes under construction next year, you know, it'll be a, uh, something the urban county government is doing. All of those are creating jobs and they're injecting money into our economy. So I think in a way we're sort of fortunate that have a lot of investment coming into our community and uh, the construction jobs that are being created. I, uh, Dr. Karf was telling me that probably 700 jobs in construction were being created just by building the medical center. And uh, so hopefully all these people are paying their payroll taxes into <laughs> Fayette County. Uh, and then uh, the additional other good news is that the World Games will start running trials uh, next year, uh, and that will be bringing 
more visitors and people spending money in our community. And of course, 2010 is not that far out. That'll be 150 million maybe going into the local economy. So we should be thankful. We may not be uh, having the increases in revenues that we want, but I think we're very lucky to be where we are today. Uh, okay. And I think the next 24 months, although they're scary, I think we're in a lot better shape than most of the communities in our state. Now, having said all that, I would like to ask Mr. O'Mara a couple of questions if it would be okay. What I, what I was hoping is that I've had a number of people contact me and there's been some confusion about the $100 licensing fee. And I wonder just for the general public if you could just maybe cover that briefly so that anybody that is, is confused would understand, you know, that it's, uh, you know, how it's structured and what the purpose is and how I think the most important thing is that you get a credit back when you send in your occupational tax in the year for the $100 fee. But could you touch on that for a second, please? Sir? Be glad to. Thank you, Council Member. The, um, the, in June, an ordinance was passed to create what we're calling a minimum license fee, which is the net profit fee, which has been in, in effect uh, uh, since the 1950s, uh, and it's been administered by paying after the fact. So when you file your federal return April 15th following the end of a calendar year, then you calculate and pay the net profit that is due. The change is a timing difference and a minimum. Uh, effective this January, we're asking everyone to pay a minimum $100 at the beginning of the calendar year. So every January 1st, all businesses start off on an even keel. They're contributing a minimum $100 to the basic services of the government in the general fund. Then when you file for that calendar year taxes, which is the April 15th following the end, you have a non-refundable $100 credit against any tax, net profit tax that you owe. So if your calculation comes out to be you owe $1,200 in local taxes, you've already paid $100 you subtract that, you pay the difference of 1100 If your calculation is that, is that you owe $95 in local taxes, you have paid the $100 minimum and nothing else is owed. All right. If you're uh, working for a company and they're withholding, you don't need to file any reports whatsoever. This would only be for businesses or sole proprietorships uh, or whether you're an LLC or corporation. That is correct. This is, this is what we call the business tax. Uh, the withholding tax uh, is unchanged, and it is being administered as it always has been. The employer withholds from the employee's paycheck based on the first dollar. So whether you've made $1,000 or $100,000, the withholding of your 0.025% is withheld and remitted to us by your employer. All right, if somebody has received an invoice and they're a little bit confused about it, I have a question. Is there a number that you could direct them to in the government that they can respond to? That? Yes, they can call 258 3040. Uh, and also, uh, there is a link on our website uh, under the, Depart uh, the Division of Revenue where you can email us. We've received uh, either one or calling LexCall. And LexCall can e has a frequently asked questions or can forward the call to us. Okay. Now, I have just one more follow up question uh, regarding. Uh, employment created in Fayette County and the construction companies that are working on these many projects that are under construction here, they're required to pay payroll tax if they're working in Fayette County. Could you maybe just touch on that short, you know, in a brief uh, way as to uh, how how we enforce that and, and how we collect the money on that? Sure. Uh, that's a service and services are taxed where the service is performed. And so we actually go to um, the construction site uh, and ask to get from the general contractor a list of the subcontractors. And we contact them and inform them if they are not already uh, knowledgeable of the uh, liability of the net profit tax for the job that they're performing in Fayette County. Um, we have a uh, good relationship with a lot of the contractors. They know to do this anyway. They don't wait. Uh, but we do have two licensed fee inspectors now, and uh, they actually go out in the field, uh, visit construction sites, as well as high turnover and um, uh, part-time locations, uh, Christmas tree, uh, Fourth of July, uh, 
firework sales, those type of things. Also, we visit the malls for their itinerant, the people that come in just for certain seasons, um, and work with uh, the different venues that, that have uh, what we call itinerant uh, uh, activity and work with them to get them informed so that they will pay their license fee as well. Have uh, you noticed a lot of new, I mean, are you all registering a lot of new people because of all the construction? Have you, can you comment on the volume of new applications? Or? We're averaging between 250 and 300 new business licenses per month. Um, and that is partly because of incorporations in Fayette County, but also because of construction. Um, that, that's down from a year ago, but it's still hundreds per month that we have new businesses registered here in Lexington. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the input on that. Okay. Uh, thanks to you, uh, Bill, and to Mr. Lane. Uh, Mr. Don Blevins. Thank you, Chair. Bill, before you sit down, there's another one we ought to do publicly. This morning we spoke about the change to insurance reporting requirements. Would you just repeat your comments from this morning for the public, please? Sure. The question was, is why is everyone getting uh, notices with their insurance premium from their insurance companies about their insurance premium? Uh, the state legislature passed an informational requirement uh, in the past legislature that requires the insurance companies to notify all of their premium uh, payers before December of this year, before the end of December of this year, that there is a local premium tax in Kentucky, that it is on their bill, and uh, that if the person feels that they are being assessed incorrectly, that they should contact the insurance company to investigate. Uh, the insurance premium tax has been on the books for I think since the 1950s, it's not a new tax. We have not raised the rate. Uh, what is different is that the insurance companies are now required to separate out on the bill the amount that is for the local insurance premium tax and notify the premium holder that it's on the bill. Beautiful, thank you. Commissioner Coe, we can return. I wanna make sure that I've heard you correctly today. Um, what I think I heard in your discussions with Councilmember Ellinger and, and Mr. Beard was that the administration feels like, given the current level of information we have in income and expense, we think we can manage our way through this year's, this fiscal year's budget. One of the steps you've taken to be proactive, just to make sure that that's the case, is that you're asking your division directors to go ahead and take another 5% off offer operating expenses for this fiscal year. That's right. Okay. If I also understood correctly, there are some known items that will be new to the budget next year, or increased at least, to the tune of, I believe, $43 million. What, now that includes $25 million for um, the police and fire pension. And, should, and that, should that stay? Kind of the, I hear you. Get, but even if that's gone, we're, we're 20 something million right. dollars short. Right. We are roughly six months from that new fiscal year. At what point would you or the administration be ready to start taking proactive measures to help alleviate next year's problem, or are you there already? Well, I, I think, you know, we, we have on the operating side, I, I think we are being proactive right now. And in addition to the 5%, we also are identifying some additional reductions that we might be able to. And for example, um, we are now requiring our divisions, other than police, fire, and corrections for their regular uniforms, um, to use the state price contract for uniforms. Um, the state realized a savings of 35 percent when they moved to this contract from a contract that was similar to the one that we have right now. So we're hoping to be able to pick up some savings in uniforms by moving to the state price contract. And um, we had the, the folks in the division of purchasing reviewing lots of different areas like that of are there opportunities for us to not diminish the level of service that we give or or diminish any level of benefit to the employee but it, in the long run save some money but it, i think the question was when i mean i think what i'm hearing from you is is when might we pull a bigger trigger is that <laughs> yep Pretty much. Um, we will have to make that decision when we have December numbers. So by the time you get back from break, um, we're going to have to make a decision about that be the, okay. that how, you, how, how aggressive we need to be in 2009. Okay, that's what I was looking for. All right, thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, how about the audit report for 2008? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. In thank fact, you, sir. I don't Can see how I could overlook you, but uh, it's okay. Mr. Stennett would like to say something. You know, obviously, you know, I wish you were bringing us a different kind of Christmas gift, but I think it's important that we're, we're talking about this today, and Councilmember Blevin kind of, kind of drives home the fact that, um, and is looking for the magic answer, but that we don't have yet. Um, I hope that you all, when you look at this during December, in terms of the administration, I know I mentioned this yesterday at our council retreat, but there can be no sacred cows in this next 2010 budget. Wait, Everything wait. has got to be on the table. Because it's not just a one department problem, it's not just a one group problem, it's an everybody problem. And it's, it's a national problem, but yet we have to, on a local level, understand that um, things are going to get tough in the next 12 months. And, and I do appreciate what you're trying to do, and, and Mary and everyone on your team, uh, because it's, uh, it's not going to be an easy task. I know when we come back from break, we may be hit with some very difficult news to swallow, but I think, you know, I don't want to speak for all my colleagues, but I think uh, all of us going forward are, are going to have to make some tough decisions, and we're willing to do so. But I just want to say that because uh, I don't envy what you have to do the next 30 days. And um, I, I know we all support doing the right thing, but uh, I certainly hope the administration looks at every stone, every organization, everybody we're giving money to, and is able to uh, make a fair assessment of what, what needs to be reduced going into 2010. Thanks. Thank you. Do our Thank best. you. And I would add, too, that I'll be happy to forego any salary next year. <laughs> <laughs> How about the audit for 2008? I'm going to turn that over to Mary. I, I think Mary Tackett, the Mary, director no. of our division of accounts. Mary account Fister. Fister, sorry. Actually, Mary's I'm one here of those today. women sorry, that hyphenate, Fister. so I'm actually Fister hyphen Tucker, so that's what causes the confusion. I apologize for that. Does everybody have a copy of the um, 2008 CAFRA, I know there, there's a couple I don't believe anybody that wasn't there this morning has uh, Councilman Beard, do you have a? Okay. Well, this Mr. is the Christmas proceed. gift that we brought to Council today. Um, we have before you the, um, I knew I was going to do that, um, the comprehensive annual report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2008. And the comprehensive annual report is really just a detailed and thorough presentation of all our activity for the year and our fund balances where they ended up for the year. Um, we were real excited. And if you notice on um, page 10, we received the um, Certificate of Excellence Reporting in 2007. And this is the 14th consecutive year that we've received this Certificate of, of Excellence Reporting. It's really the highest honor a government can receive um, for doing the extra steps to produce a comprehensive annual report that gives the citizens and the council and management um, all the relevant information by which to make decisions by. So we're real pleased with that. Um, as you all know and are well aware, we had some challenges in 2007 um, with relation to the implementation of our new computer module. Um, so, so that's, I think, what, what really makes that award so special and more special than it has been in previous years. Um, I wanted to talk just briefly about the CAFR and what it is and what it contains. Um, there's three main sections to the CAFR, the first of which is the introductory section. Um, it contains two letters of transmittal, one from the mayor and one from Commissioner Cole. Um, it also has with it the um, organizational structures and a council map um, for the viewers at home. Um, this document will be available on the website for those of you at home um, sometime later this week. So we have not officially issued the report. We just wanted to get it to you guys before you went on break. Um, but it, the content will not change at all. The only thing that may change is spacing and, you know, things like that. Um, the second section 
is the financial section. And um, the financial section begins with the statement of, from our um, external auditors on page 13. And I just wanted to point out um, a couple of things in the, in the report from them. First of with which they conduct their audit in accordance with generally accepted accounting standards that are accepted you know, federally for the entire United States. Um, and they're governed by um, the Office of the Comptroller for the United States government. And um, we were successful in receiving a, what we consider a clean opinion. Um, and basically that means that the auditors, after assessing our internal controls and all the ending balances, felt that this financial statement represents fairly the financial condition in all material aspects of our government. Um, the audit, just to give you some, some information as far as the timing and how it worked this year, um, as you know, we did not issue the June statement for 2007 um, until June 5th of 2008 because of all the challenges we had. Um, so the audit work for the 08 audit began as soon as the, um, the 07 CAFR was running, was, you know, print, coming off the presses. Um, so they begin their prelim work in the month of June, and during that time they're actually assessing our internal controls, they're going around to all the different divisions, um, they hit different areas, different years to kind of assess, you know, our, our, do we have our controls in place to prevent any material misstatement or fraud. Um, the, so they, they, can, they conduct that preliminary work. Generally, it takes about two weeks for them to do that, a little longer this year because we had some new auditing standards um, that required a more detailed review of the internal controls. Um, and then we proceed after June 30th in closing the books. We were actually able to close the books this year, and I credit it to the staff in the accounting division and to um, PeopleSoft, we were actually to able to close on August 19th of this year, which I believe is as early as it's been done since back in the 80s. So um, we were real excited about that. And the auditors actually began what they call their field work on August, on August 18th as well, or 19th. Um, so the auditors spent about four weeks with us during the ending part of August, the first part of September where they actually went through transaction-based testing and balance-based testing from, from a balance sheet perspective to make sure that everything that we have reported in this document is fair and that they, that they could reconcile the, the numbers. Um, the field work actually finished um, right around the September 19th, and so the auditors left for a period. And between the middle of September and the first part of November, we actually created the schedules, wrote the footnotes, the management discussion and analysis, and all the different pieces of the CAFR. So, um, you know, it takes a little over a month and a half to actually come up with these 160 some odd pages. Um, and at that same time, we're actually waiting to receive financial statements from all the entities that we consider a component unit of our government. We have, diff we have nine different um, companies or entities that we actually report as part of the Lexington and Fayette Urban County government. And they're the Lexington Center Corporation, the Airport Board, the Department of Health, Tra Lextran, the Library, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, Explorium, Downtown Development Corporation, and the Parking Authority of Lexington. So we have to wait to get the financial statements from, from um, all but three of those entities, because we actually do the accounting for three of those um, companies. So we have to wait to get the financial statements from the other six entities, and then we, we roll that into our financial states statements and produce this report that we're presenting to you today. Um, so again, it, within the financial section, after the, um, the audit report, um, you'll find the management discussion and analysis. Um, this is where we attempt, in layman's terms, to tell you what happened. 
If you, have, if you don't have time to do anything else, I highly recommend that this be the first thing you read. And for viewers at home, if you want to you know, know what's going on with the, the city government, reading the management discussion analysis gives you that information. Um, also contained in the financial section is the, um, are the government-wide financial statements, um, which begin on page 32 and go through page 35. And then you have um, the, the governmental fund statements, um, the proprietary fund statements, fiduciary fund statements, and then you come to the footnote section. The footnote section, in my opinion, would be probably the second most important part to read if you have more time. Um, the footnotes go into great detail on what makes up the numbers and the supporting the, um, information regarding the different sections of each one of the financial statements. Um, and then we also have, after the footnotes, all the required supplemental information that's required by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Um, the last section of the CAFR is the statistical section, which um, contains primarily trend data it also contains some non-financial data. So, you know, earlier that it came up about the top 10 employers, that's presented there. Um, and so we do actively track, you know, the non-financial things in the CAFR that you can see from a historical perspective what, you know, what has changed. Um, I know that most of you were in the session this morning where we went over the balance sheets, but I did want to just take a brief second to go over some of the key highlights. Um, if you turn to page 36, you'll notice that um, in the other governmental funds column, if you compare the ending fund balance this year to last year, we actually had a decline or a deterioration of the other um, governmental fund balance by 16, um, almost $17 million. Um, this decline was primarily um, due to capital projects that we have undertaken during um, 2007, 2008 that we haven't yet bonded. So if you can think of it in terms of if you wrote a check for your house and didn't go get your mortgage for another year. You know, that, that, that's basically what we've done. So, um, so our, the, the, the net assets or the net fund balance of the other governmental funds have declined because we haven't issued bonds yet. If we had issued bonds as of June 30th, we actually would um, have seen um, over a $3 million increase in that fund balance overall um, because we have actually spent um, over $19 million on projects that we have not bonded yet. <laughs> um, the other thing that I wanted to point out, and if you can, um, on that same page, look at the very first column under the governmental funds. And you'll notice that our um, fund balance for the governmental funds in total is um, $24.4 million. Um, that includes um, 5.2 million that we have outstanding um, for purchase orders as of year end. And it also includes the economic contingency. Um, the economic contingency grew um, during FY08 and is now at a level of $13.2 million. Um, that $13.2 million will actually increase again. Um, in 09 because if you look right below that, you'll see that there's an undesignated fund balance of $4.6 million. Part of the ordinance related to the economic contingency provides for us setting aside 25% of that undesignated fund balance after um, capital carry forwards um, and, and after what we utilized in the 09 budget um, to go into the economic contingency fund. So I know the number that's real important to you guys is, you know, what's available for spending. Of that $4.6 million, about $3.1 million um, will be available to soften the blow um, of what we're looking at in 2010. 
um, but as we you know discussed earlier that's not going to be near enough to cover um, what we're projecting as a deficit um, so if you look at the total, the 24.4 um, million, that actually declined $18 million from prior year. Um, if you look on um, page 42, um, the third line from the bottom where, well actually before the, the reconciliation, you'll see a, a line called net change in fund balance. And if you recall, through um, the original budget and all the budget amendments that came before the council during FY08 and after the end of FY08 when you approved the funding of the internal service fund, um, we actually had an amended budget of a loss of $22.4 million. So, um, we actually exceeded our budgeted um, fund balance projection um, by $3.7 million, so we were to the good. Um, I just want to, to point out to, to you that part of that $18 million decline is um, due to us funding the internal service funds, and so $12.9 million came out of the general fund and went into the urban service fund to cover expenses, law, um, claims that we know we've incurred or we project that we have incurred but that have not been reported to us yet. Um, so it's really a presentation, per, you know, from a presentation perspective, 12.9 million was not truly a loss to the government. It just, it went from one, well, it was a loss to the government, it went from one fund to another fund. Because um, in prior years, we actually had a deficit balance in the internal service fund balance. Um, the, um, just as some budget highlights, as far as, you know, we, I said that we came out more positive than we thought from budget, and most of that was driven by an increase in revenues. Um, and just to highlight where that increase was, um, we did see an increase of about $400,000 on the um, real estate uh, property taxes um, in the general fund. We saw a growth in our detention center related fees, both from the detention center and from the district court jail fees. Both of those were up. Um, and those two items together accounted for almost $2 million of the swing. Um, the EMS revenues are up, and if you recall, we actually increased our EMS um, fees so that we could, um, you know, be in line with the, the allowable charge for Medicaid and Medicare. And so that was up about a half million dollars. Cheers. And um, I wanted to point out, too, near the end of the page 40, that penalties and interest was up almost $500,000. And I think that can be largely attributable to um, Bill Mayer's department and to, to the council's foresight of adding those positions to the revenue department because it's, it's paying off. You can see that we actually exceeded revenue by almost you know, half a million dollars just from the positions that were added. So it's money well spent. Um, uh, Mrs. Fister? Yes. Uh, I do have a suggestion. Yes. And that is that uh, it's hard for people to follow you because they don't have the copies of them okay. with you. And uh, this is uh, the most important financial document I think the government produces every year. And my suggestion would be to uh, give everyone a chance to read this over and study it and put it on the docket for next month so that we okay. can that would have be a thorough good. discussion of it at that time. Okay. That sounds good. Is there any questions before we do that? Yes, Mr. Lane. Yeah, I was just wondering, are we going to be able to post this on the Internet so that the yes. taxpayer will be able to go look at it? Yes. She said by Friday. Yeah, by Friday. All of our um, CAFRs are out on the Internet, and this will be as well. Okay, thank you. I would urge the council members to uh, take a good look at this because this is a very important document. Some of us did get a brief look at it earlier, but uh, there's very important information on every page. And I congratulate you all on winning the award again this year. And even more, I congratulate you on getting the auditors to work and 
the third week of August. That is a record. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. Did you have anything else you wanted to close with? Uh, no, that's it. I'll, I'll be back to you in January. And actually, in January, we're hopeful that we'll be bringing um, the first six months of 09 in a balance sheet type format. Good. Well, we'll have tidings of great joy maybe next great. month. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how about the format for the 2010 budget? Um, actually, I had hoped to have something prepared to share with you today, but, but I think um, we're, we're going to probably want to look at a different format this year in that we will probably not be asking our divisions to prepare uh, requests for, for expansion, new and expanded, be, because it's very likely that we're going to be reducing everywhere. Of course, we will make a provision for things that absolutely positively have to happen, um, but um, I, I, over the uh, holidays, I'll work on some um, format issues and bring those back to you in January to see if, if you'll be okay with um, changes that we might make in the way we present the information to you. Okay, thank you. Are there questions about the format for 2010? <laughs> Hearing none, we thank you very much for your thorough report today. The first thing on the agenda today is the Equine Task Force recommendations for a committee consideration. Uh, the last Budget and Finance Committee, we went over the report of the Equine Task Force, and there are many things that could and need to be done in regarding our signature industry. Uh, I've looked over the list. Uh, there are things that need to be done with the state, with the Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association, with Keeneland, with Central Kentucky Legislative Caucus, with the Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Law Department, and, uh, of course, PDR. And uh, all these are very important. And I am uncomfortable leaving this hanging in the air. And what I would suggest that the committee consider, and uh, Mr. Southers and I have talked about this, he and I would be glad to put on our uh, shoes and go call on all these various elements that need to be con uh, contacted and bring and prepare for the next Budget and Finance Committee some specific recommendations that we as a government can do. Of course, some of the things are not part of us. The only thing on here I think that's urgent is the Central Kentucky Caucus. And I think if we want to make a plea in the legislature for removing the sales tax inequities for equine, we need to uh, do that now. And so I would, if, if it suits the committee, uh, Mr. Southers and I will do this work uh, the rest of this month and have it ready for you in, in the new year, except for the Central Kentucky Caucus. And if, I would like to have an uh, expression of what the committee thinks we ought to do about that. Mrs. Garten. Thank you very much, Dr. Stevens. I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, I would just like to advocate, um, I would hope that by the time the folks get here in 656 days, 14 hours and two minutes and five seconds, is that what that clock says? Yeah, <laughs> For the games that we would be branded I think the branding can't wait either because it's going to take a while to get the branding in place. And so I hope your recommendations will look at how we can brand ourselves with the blue horse through wayfinding signs, through parks, through bus shelters, however we can get that little guy up there to help brand us. I think that's going to take a little bit of time to do, so I'll look look forward to your well I would agree and I think that one of the uh, Mr. Lord wasn't here at our last meeting and he was going to present a report but he got called away to Frankfurt so one of the first stops we'll make is at the Lexington Convention Visitors Bureau to check on the branding and also what we can do to augment tourism as far as uh, the equine is concerned Mr. Gray thank you can I ask a question doc uh, can you go over that one more time for us, what you're planning to do to, to uh, move the ball forward, just that process that you described. You said you and Jerry were going to go to the various constituencies. Is that 
Yes, to these various elements like the, uh, uh, for example, to create the Economic Development Office and to advocate the interest of horse industry, that would be a, a governor's prerogative to do that. And I would suggest that he and I will go over to Frankfurt and visit with the governor's staff to see exactly what that status might be. Uh, we, we don't want to make this uh, exclusionary. And if anybody wants to go with us, we're more than happy to have them no, but just to do the field work to see where it stands. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll bring it back, and I don't know who's going to be on the budget committee next time or who's going to be. Uh, I know who the vice mayor is going to be, and I'll be happy mm. to consult with him. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you, so sir. this can carry forward. Okay. Yeah, I, well, we all appreciate you taking the initiative on this. Uh, but we would go to Particularly this. in your, uh, the illusion of retirement that you're creating. <laughs> well, right. I propose this will be done before Santa Claus gets here. <laughs> oh, my goodness, that's great. Okay, thank you, sir. Any other questions? How about the uh, tax inequities? Do we think we want to recommend to the council that we uh, put that on our legislative yes. agenda for uh, Fayette County and the Central Kentucky Caucus? Yes. If so, I think a motion would be in order, and I can take that to the committee. Uh, yes. Mrs. Garten moves that. Uh, we take to the Central Kentucky Caucus the issue of sales tax inequities for horse farm owners. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded that we consider a change of classification for horses to livestock so that the sales tax inequities can be alleviated. Mr. Blevins. Uh, I wonder if you would accept a friendly amendment to also send this to our own uh, Legislative liaison, Mr. Sheehy, is his Sheehy. name? Gosh, I totally blanked, Mr. Ned Sheehy, so that our own efforts will be in line yes. with the caucus. Yes. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. It's passed, and uh, uh, I'll bring that to the council this afternoon so they can also weigh in on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Van Pelt, did you have anything you want to say about your shop today? I was just going to uh, make one brief comment and state that um, based on the comments that were made during the, our presentation last week that we would just, we've um, gone along with what Commissioner Coe was discussing about trimming our budget and we were creative going into this budget year and we reduced our budget by 8.9 percent we've also trimmed five percent out of the operating and we can be creative as necessary because we know we're we want to play with it along with everyone else in reducing our expenses and we feel like we just want to have the ability to reach out and match the federal matching funds that are available in the future that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we thank you for the job you do. Uh, if you in your packet, there are two pages, one representing the equine task force recommendations that was part of our committee, then the second is priorities. The equine task force, um, with the services of Preston Osborne, drafted this, but I thought the one we had that I recited to you is a little more precise and inclusive. Uh, so we'll move forward with this, and I thank you very much for your support of Jerry and I and your confidence in us. The next is the report of the internal audit and the director of the internal audit, Bruce Sally. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. It is my pleasure to come before the Budget and Finance Committee uh, basically on a quarterly basis and report out on a couple of internal audits that have been recently completed. Before I get into that, and I know that time is, is important here and I will be brief with my comment, but there is one other item that I wanted to mention that is not actually in your packet. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of serving with two council members on my internal audit board, Council Member Stevens and Council Member Myers, who is not here today. And in particular today, Dr. Stevens, I would like to uh, state my appreciation, sir for your service on the Internal Audit Board. You have served on the Internal Audit Board for four and a half years. And during that time, you have displayed a complete and full dedication to the Internal Audit function that we try to provide here. 
You've been a source of consistently good counsel and institutional knowledge has been of great value to the internal audit function. I greatly appreciate the support you have given both to me and to the entire audit staff. And I want you to know, sir, it has been a genuine pleasure working with you, and I thank you for your service on the Internal Audit Board. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sally. I uh, have enjoyed serving at your direction on the Internal Audit Board. And, uh, of course, the fact that the chairman lives next door to me and makes sure I make it to all the meetings makes a big difference, too. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're quite welcome, sir. In your packet today, there are a couple of uh, summaries of internal audits that were recently completed. Um, I want to also point out in the internal audit process just a couple of important points. Uh, it is important to understand that internal controls are the responsibility of management, and each individual department and division has the basic responsibility for establishing, maintaining, and periodically reviewing its own internal control system. The objectives of the Office of Internal Audit are to assist members of the urban county government in their effective discharge of their responsibilities by furnishing them with analysis, recommendation, counsel, and information concerning the activities reviewed and by promoting effective internal control at a reasonable cost. And the second thing that I would just want to emphasize to the council and also to the viewing public, it should be noted that findings are a common result of an audit and they do not in and of themselves indicate carelessness or negligence on the part of management. Deficiencies identified during an audit can be the result of many factors, some of which are only partly controllable by management. Uh, and in addition, internal audit reports are designed to draw attention to opportunities for improvement, and therefore they do not address the areas of satisfactory performance that may be noted during an audit, and therefore council is encouraged to maintain a balanced perspective regarding the nature and extent of internal audit findings. Uh, in the uh, summary of audit results, uh, First in your packet, you will see an audit of the Division of Engineering Project Management. This audit was uh, completed on October 8th, 2008. The general control objectives of that audit were to determine that project information was sufficient to allow for efficient and effective project management. Projects were properly managed to ensure timely completion. Project costs were clearly identified in the PeopleSoft system and could be tracked and reported for cost allocation purposes. Change orders were properly documented and their necessity clearly defined and change order cost was effectively managed. The bullets you see next in your, in your handout are as follows. As uh, taken as a whole, the capital project information was significantly disconnected and it did not lend itself to good overall project organization or evaluation. Uh, a centralized database is needed to capture all capital project financial information, change order activity, payments to vendors, and to monitor the budget status of those projects. Uh, this database also needs to track anticipated completion dates, major project delays, and actual versus projected project costs. It should also include features to identify possible trends of intentional low bidding, establish a history of change order activity among divisions, contractors, and types of projects, and provide a history of contractor performance standards that can be used to evaluate future contractor selection. Another item that we noted was that there was insufficient project coordination and communication between divisions that are involved in a given capital project, and there was no clear assignment of overall project responsibility for managing those projects. The overall authority and responsibility for capital project coordination and management should be assigned to a specific division or group in order to increase project accountability and improve the effectiveness of capital project management. Universal project numbering conventions should be established in order to assign unique identifiers to each capital project. Identifiers should be assigned to all related contracts, change orders, and financial transactions so that activity related to a specific project can be matched to that project throughout its life cycle, regardless of the type of document, transaction, or the input source as, for example, the various divisions from which the input source is coming. Detailed tracking of change order activity was lacking and needs to be incorporated into the recommended project management database and change orders that increase project costs should be reviewed and approved by the division to purchasing prior to their being submitted to the council. Uh, management's responses to the findings indicated appropriate action would be taken to correct the deficiencies identified. The management and staff were very courteous and cooperative throughout the course of the audit. Uh, and the next page of your handout are the uh, finding summaries for an audit 
of the Haley Pike landfill collection process, which was completed in September of 2008. Those control objectives were to determine that controls over cash and cash receipts were sufficient and functioning properly. Cash receipts were accurately deposited on a timely basis. Physical security procedures were in place and being followed. Written cash handling policies and procedures were current and were being adhered to. And landfill usage rates were consistent with any related ordinance and appropriate charges were being accurately assessed. The findings that we noted during that audit, the landfill employees responsible for generating way tickets and collecting their related cash payments had the ability to add and or edit transaction data in the auto scale system. There was no process in place to ensure that daily online reports per auto scale agreed with the related way tickets. A daily report totaling all daily transactions by cash and charge transactions was needed. This report should be reconciled by management personnel to their way tickets and agreed on a daily basis to the deposit report. A one employee division of revenue created accounts for charge customers who would be using the landfill on a recurring basis. This employee also sent out the monthly billing to customers. They addressed customer billing issues and they received charge customer payments, thereby creating a segregation of dues issue. A monthly report of landfill customer charge accounts complete with aging and write-off activity should be provided to the Director of Revenue. Landfill did not have a written procedure regarding the service of non-cash customers, deposit preparation, cash handling, or safeguarding of cash. And the auto scale transaction backup procedures were limited to a monthly download sent to the Department of Revenue and if possible transaction data should be backed up at least weekly to improve data security and recovery controls. Managers' responses to this audit also indicated that appropriate action will be taken to correct the deficiencies identified, and the management and staff were very courteous and cooperative throughout the course of the audit. And with that, I would uh, be willing to uh, answer any questions you may have about the uh, audits that I presented here today. Okay. Are there any questions? Mrs. Gordon. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Stevens. Bruce, thank you very much. Um, I respect your work a lot, and um, I don't really want to say a lot right now, but on the, in particular, on the uh, engineering audit, my question would be at the bottom, you, I, I think there's some serious things that you've reported back in your audit, and I'm wondering if how specific the management's responses are for corrective action. I believe a, a few weeks ago I sent the report out to council. Did you have a chance to look Management's at responses. Yes, we had management's responses in it. Was there any particular item about the responses you had a concern well, about? Well, some of this, um, I mean, will there be reorganization? Will there be new people? Will there be reassignments of, mm -hmm. of job duties to fulfill, you know, coordination, communication, uh, make disconnection, connection, those sorts of things? When I came before the uh, committee, I think it was two months ago, I talked about the tracking matrix yes. that I have. And I think to answer your question, I will be revisiting these particular points uh, in a matter of a very few months with uh, senior management, with division management, to determine exactly what kind of processes have been placed to address that. Okay, that was going to be my next question, is when would you revisit? Because I remember your mm -hmm. spreadsheet of right. what you'd revisited and what actions mm -hmm. had been taken, so that'll be in a couple months. Or in these particular so. responses, there was not a specific time frame given. Mm -hmm. uh, typically what I look for there is I would give them no more than six months before I would go back and revisit. Uh, I certainly have no issue with going back before then. I agree with you. There were some significant issues identified here. Mm -hmm. And uh, if nothing else, perhaps February or so, that would give them about four months period. Well, I'm, I'm not an auditor, mm -hmm. but, but I, I would think that going back before six months might be a good idea. As you recall, yes. this came from the Stormwater Oversight Committee this recommendation to audit and it was because of some very specific situations 
And I think this is actually, a, this is a different, this, this is actually an audit that we completed. We're in the process of completing of, before stormwater. Yes. Well, I remember the first okay. one, mm -hmm. but the, uh, so this isn't connected. No, oh. no, it is not. We are actually in the process of doing the field work now mm -hmm. for the, uh, the first one for the stormwater related concerns that you okay. have now. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that. I, I personally would like to see you go back before six months. All right. Very That's good. just my opinion. Yeah, th this project here was, uh, what we were looking at in this particular audit was to look at the process for project planning, monitoring, documentation, cost management, and project time management. Now, the field work that we are now doing that relates to your concern mm -hmm. is going to be looking, uh, let me look at my notes here and make sure I speak correctly to this. We're going to be looking at uh, the engineering s steps really that relate to what is in their council approved manual. Right, the engineering For documenting manuals. site visits, for uh, documenting uh, their uh, follow-up on problems that are discovered during site visits, uh, looking at uh, how they are, are, are uh, dealing with citizens' complaints and that sort of nature. So the next the audit we're now doing from a fieldwork perspective deals less with project cost management, if you will, management. and more in terms of, of a field management perspective, if that, okay. if that clarifies. It seems to me there is a connection, though. There, there is. It, the Division of Engineering, of course, is, as you well know, I mean, their process is a, is a very large and, and complicated one. And so this, this project, you have to kind of slice these things up so, you, so that the project, the audit project, does not become really too, too much to get into one, into one scope. Right. So this one was looking more in terms of, how, how they document things like uh, delays in the project, project cost, uh, evaluation of, of uh, contractor performance, and things of that nature. This next one is going to be looking at, as I say, how they deal with, uh, if you will, issues on the ground, the so to speak. Well, I appreciate you're doing both of them and, and well, you're quite reporting welcome. back. And this is always good information for council members to have. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Webb, did you want to address something right now, or did you want to feel Mr. Blevins' question first? <laughs> Which I think will deal with engineering also. I just wanted to fill in some gaps about what's been done as, as far as tracking projects that uh, the, the Could you step saw. to the microphone just a little closer? Thanks. I'm sorry. Uh, we're currently, Kevin Wente is serving as a point person with finance, setting up uh, interviews for folks that track grant bond capital projects in engineering, traffic engineering, uh, planning. They're currently setting up those interviews to collect all the data they can to try to build that into PeopleSoft so they can develop a system that will work for everybody. However, we expect that once we find out what PeopleSoft will track for us, that w there may be a need for an additional database, but we w need to get through that step first. But we, those are just those interviews are just starting right now. Just wanted to let you know that was going on. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Blevins, I wanted to follow up on Councilmember Gordon. In fact, she weighed right in where I wanted to go. Uh, the audit that we're discussing today about capital projects is was separately started some months ago or maybe even a year. The other one that we're interested in that, that she mentioned was the one initiated out of the Stormwater Oversight Committee meeting. Do you have any feel for when we might see that audit completed? Uh, I actually asked my uh, staff auditor about that this morning and let me, let me see this response here. Sent me an email and I can find it here. Um, he's uh, pulling samples of both active and inactive projects for review. Uh, he's going to be focusing uh, on, on how, how that inspection process matches up with their own council approved uh, procedure manual. Beautiful. He said to me, and this is just an estimate uh, field work time frame should be the first to middle of January for completion. And uh, so after that is done, then I have to review his work papers. 
We work on the draft, uh, clear up any uh, any items I feel that maybe uh, from looking at the draft report are not clarified or fully issued or fully addressed. So hopefully, hopefully, maybe early February. All right, thank it's you. It's a it's a large, and I will tell you, complicated project. They have nice thick manuals that we're trying to wade through and look at what what are the pertinent items that we need to test against. Right. I, I am not surprised it's a complicated audit. So uh, thank you. I just want to see where, where we stood on that. Make sure that we weren't talking about, make sure that we are talking about two different audits here. Yes, sir. We are. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill, can you, you may have said this and I missed it. If I did, I apologize. But how did you go about benchmarking or determining what sort of, well, determining what benchmarks were for best of class or whatever. I mean, this is basically a management competencies audit, it seems like to me. I mean, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. You're talking about the one that I'm speaking of today, the not, the, not the one in progress? The Division of Engineering Project Management. Okay. What we, if you look at, in, in terms of some of the recommendations, um, particularly with regard, say, to the database, well, the some of the information that we mentioned in here that needs to be included, uh, these, these are items that from an internal control perspective, you need to be able to identify for your overall project management. Some of them relate to cost. Some of them relate to project timelines. Some of them relate to, uh, well, for example, looking at possible trends of low bidding. Now, we didn't see any examples of that, but those are the kind of things that you want to be able to identify. Okay. The reason that I'm, you know, forgive me on this, but since this is a business that I'm in, in a day job, I'm very sensitive about this. And for two years since I've been on the council, I've been talking about these issues. And Jay McCord, Councilmember McCord, introduced me to what he considered to be these issues from his tenure on the council, which he described it shorthand as a problem with throughput, getting jobs through the system. And, um, I have been, frankly, reluctant to be as forthcoming on the concerns that I've had about this for a long time. But after two years, I am sure that one of the core skill sets and one of the core competencies that this government must have is project management, because that's what we do a lot of. And. What I have observed is that those skill sets are not here in, at, in abundance for sure, in a way that you would expect them to be, and that we really aren't making any progress on it. Now, it looks like to me that the things that you've examined are technical dimensions of project management. Do you have the proper cash management protocols in place? Do you have scheduling technologies in place? It looks like to me that those are the things that you've examined. That, I'm that not so nice. sure, though, that you are getting that we are getting at the core problem, which is the competency of closure and management on projects, and it's all across the universe. Okay. And one of, I'm going to simply illustrate this as an example, not to be punitive, because I was trying to be helpful. When the Friends of Raven Run came to me in exasperation and they said, please give us some help here. We're not getting anywhere with the new visitor center, what's it called? The, that we, right. And Michelle and Jerry have worked hard on that project. And I'm not using this platform to complain about that. What I have said after I got someone from our company to assist and to help 
was that these are, these are not, Joe, you know what I've talked about, these are not day-to-day -day competencies of people who are doing jobs in parks. When we expect them to do this, these activities, and it, then we are expecting perhaps too much. But these are management issues. And if the Department of Engineering is responsible for project management and is not able to get that done, then the question is, what are we doing about it? And Councilmember Blevins has said, Mike, that you've been successful in introducing some new accountability protocols, perhaps. And if you could share that with us, I think that'd be useful. But I don't know that we're getting to the substance and the essence of the problem by examining whether or not we're, we've got the proper purchasing protocols, which frankly, looking at Raven Run, we had purchasing protocols in overdose on steroids. It took for three years going up and down, back and forth to get to the same conclusion. And that, and so the friends of Raven Run who have committed half a million dollars to that project are exhausted with our government's management of the project. Okay. Mike, I didn't mean to, you know, I've, as I've said, I've heard that you're doing some good things here. So can't, would you be willing to share with us from that point of view? Is that appropriate or not? Some of the things, you know, Councilmember Blevins says you're introducing some good accountability protocols and, you know, just getting closure on things. You know, I don't, I don't know how much detail I don't have a written document that I have passed out to people uh, but what I have tried to do is communicate a what you are accountable for and expectations for folks uh, it it has not gotten as deep as how we reorganize yet however that is under dis, you know we were having discussions now it's just uh, not at a point to share a whole lot of that, but I have, it's sort of how I was brought up in the industry that I was in about how, how you become accountable, what you're accountable for, and how you respond when, you're re when it's your job or there's information that's needed. And not only that piece, but how teamwork plays into all this that Everybody cannot be accountable to know every piece of information. And that as public works, I would like us to be seen as a group that doesn't let the gentleman or the lady next to you drop the ball. If you're aware and you can help at that time, it's your job in my eyes to keep that ball from dropping. Now, I know that I know this is very general, but I didn't come here prepared to share any and any individual things, but I think it, it starts at a very low level, and that is Would discussions you, on the front line, you, uh, very frank discussions, you, you, and where appropriate, those discussions are taking place. Now, that does not mean that, uh, that we would have a division of project management because we're having those decisions, but I, I think it's moving us all in the right direction that even though we don't, we're going to have to share some of those responsibilities and be accountable for projects as they move through the process. Now, I, I shared this with some folks. You can have a, before you have a process that's good, you can have a process that's not so good, but if everyone works through that process efficiently, you can make it work better than it works today. And I think that's where we are right now until we can get some of the software tools and get some of the reorganization done that we need that will really move projects and and help us measure the accountability. Uh, being accountable for something always requires a measurement of are you are you reaching that accountable goal. So without well, Mr. Sims, Mr. Sims is going to properly cut me off, but I want to say in short, just as a sound bite finish, you're giving us a ray of hope. That is very much welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gray and Commissioner Webb. Mr. Stennett. Thank you, Commissioner Webb. Before you leave, and I didn't want to cut you off, Vice Mayor. That's all right. <laughs> I was just going to, 
uh, add, if I, if I might, um, I've, I've dealt with this issue a, a couple of times in the last few years being on council, but uh, I guess what we all want to know is what, what's your time frame on dealing with this? I mean, are we going to hear something back in the next month? I know you can't share details today, but, but when, will, when will you be able to share details? A month, two months? Or is this going to be an ongoing challenge that we just have to keep asking about? So, <laughs> no, so. I, hope it's, I hope it's not an ongoing challenge. It actually extends outside of, of public works as you see it today. Uh, so I, I don't want to put a time limit. It's going to be more than a month. Uh, and at some point, I'm not sure what the proper way to get back is. Maybe I would get back through the chair of the committee and what we'd like to do is when, when we come up with with some of the changes is, is start sharing those and get your input on how you feel they'll work and uh, and how we move forward. Yeah, I assume some of those changes are going to be personnel assignments, managerial changes, all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. Okay, because I mean we we have some departments that are. The engineering is doing their work that, that they have to rely on and vice versa. We, we've right. talked about and that we're, trying, we're looking now at how we line those things up okay. uh, a little bit differently. And I, we're, we're very early in those discussions outside of engineering. So uh, really would like to get through those before I start sharing any information uh, on that. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, are there further questions for Mr. Sally? Uh, Mr. Blevins and Mr. Lane. <laughs> Mr. Webb, before you run off, you might as well stay up here. I, I just want to make sure, I, and Mr. Saul, you may, you may need to answer this as well. I want to make sure I understood the audit. I think part of the problem is some of our capital projects uh, span multiple departments. So, for example, a parks project uses engineering resources, and it becomes unclear who's running the show, and that's where we get into trouble. So that's one level of problem. In addition, the technical underpinnings of running a project, what the vice mayor was getting at a minute ago, are also evidently somewhat problematic for us. That was some of the findings. We don't have the software in place. We're not keeping track of our chain orders appropriately and blah, blah, blah. Was the part of the audit also to look at projects that are managed just within the engineering department as opposed to multi-department? Were there a few examples of those looked at as well? You will actually ha have to ask Mr. Sali. This audit was done prior to me being here. I've Let him answer. Let's see. The, the projects we looked at in our sample typically were large projects, and therefore they did reach out past just the engineering division. But our, our primary focus was on the engineering process itself. But what we found, as, as you alluded to, was because they, they do transcend divisional boundaries, that there, there is no specific responsibility, clear responsibility assigned for completion. Uh, there's breakdown in communications between the various divisions. Now, that doesn't mean that any one division is not doing its job well or as well as they think they can with their specific piece of the pie. But it, but it doesn't fit together well because of the, how these projects do involve so many different divisions. Uh, there, there is just simply a, a, a breakdown in how that process is managed and who's responsible for that process. And there's no database, there's no consistent amount of, of project data that can be examined where any individual from whatever division, regardless of the input, can look at it and say, here's where the status of the project here is. Here's where the delays seem to be. Mm -hmm. uh, here's where it appears to be on its continuum, its, its life cycle. Well, from my world, and I come from the project management world, what you're describing is a lack of project management. Yes. There is no single focus that's worried about the day-to-day -day aspects of the project completion, schedule, time frame, and all that kind of stuff. What I was trying to allude to for you, Commissioner Webb, is that I would expect of all the divisions in our government, there will be one that knows how to do that, and that would be the engineering department. And if they're doing, if they're having difficulties doing even the basic blocking and tackling on their own internal projects, that's a pretty large indictment. If it's just located to the large meta, multi-department kinds of projects, that becomes more of an executive level problem because we're not assigning responsibility, and that's. That may be the results of the audit. I, I have not read the audit in some months, so I can't remember the details, but I would encourage you to look at it in two lights. One is from a multi-department point of view, but also 
is the engineering department itself for following best management practices for project management? Take care of that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lane. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Webb. One of the things that happened in the last year is that we split off the, uh, created the environmental quality area, which, uh, you know, spun out Saga Solid Waste, Sanitary Sewers, and Storm Sewers That's out, of, out of Public Works. Is that not correct? Mm -hmm. Storm Sewers are still maintained by streets and roads. All right. My, I guess my question, and I don't know the answer to this, and I, I don't, is, is your engineering staff still providing support for sanitary sewers and and uh, doing the engineering work and, and doing construction management and supervision of the construction uh, is that part of the function of engineering yeah. yes we are still working together on those we are working and supporting okay well i just want to reiterate i've had strong reservations about how well that department's been working also and, you know, I, I was hoping that when the department split out, maybe we'd be using outside engineers to help run some of the major uh, storm and uh, sanitary sewer jobs that we're doing because of the scope of that work. Uh, do you feel, um, based on this report, that we're doing a good job for sanitary sewer and storm well, sewer? I actually sat down with Marwan and went through each of these items whenever I got the, the report was final and looked at some of his suggestions for how we, and one of, one of the things that I think we, he, he proposed to me, and one of the things that we don't do is, or is not done right now, is the design person does not follow the project all the way through. Therefore, there's decisions made down, down the road during the construction phase that may not be understood, may, may involve a change order that's not going back and checking in with that design person. So we have talked about a single point of contact for a project that would not only follow the project all the way through and be in, involved in that decision making during the construction phase on changes in the design but would also track all the paperwork that's associated with the project. And, you know, some of the things that were brought out in the, in the audit were you cannot go and you can't go to the council clerk's office. Occasionally a document will be titled different than it is in engineering. It may exist there, but you can't easily go find that document in both locations. Some of those types of issues, we are really hoping that the PeopleSoft uh, unique identification and tracking numbers will track all the financials and all the documents that go along with a, with a project that can be very complex and take place over a number of years. A road construction project will have a lot of documents and, and having a unique identifier in, a, in one location for all those documents will help would help a lot of this what was identified here. But I think one key thing until we get uh, a management group of people is the fact that we have that single point who handles the paper and keeps all the paper and follows the project through and understands the changes from the design to the construction and the closeout. On, on some of the larger projects that we have, do you think it would be practical to outsource the construction management uh, so that we could have a company that's got trained expert people who can be on top of the job and they can handle one project at a time? Because, I mean, we're talking about spending hundreds of millions of dollars on our sanitary sewer improvements over the next few years. And to have bad project management on this is not a good thing. Uh, that should be our top priority because it's going to uh, – the efficiency of getting the work done, the cost. There are so many factors that project management handles, and if we're not doing a good job on this, you know, I'm very, very concerned about this issue. Uh, and I, I, would, I would ask you, as part of your analysis, to look and see what would be the practicability of outsourcing some of the construction management services. It will certainly be considered. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lane. 
And thank you, Mr. Sally, for your report and for your kind words. And we'll go to item four, Man of War Projects and SLX status. Mr. Conyers. I hope there's a lot of money in that SLX sock. Stays constant, pretty much. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, for the viewers at home, I'm Max Conyers. I'm the Transportation Planning Manager for the Urban County Government and uh, Director of the Lexington Metropolitan Planning Organization, organization that does uh, transportation planning process for Fayette and Jessamine. Um, today I've just prepared five slides for you, and uh, the slides are designed to uh, just meet the request that, uh, that you all ask of us at the work session. Um, Council Member Myers and uh, McCord specifically. Uh, uh, and uh, the first item, I think it, pretty much the entire council wanted to get a clear uh, view of our MPO areas of representation. And so I uh, had our jo Joey David on our staff prepare this good map. Uh, you see it's color coded. It shows how the council districts are aggregated into uh, Three, uh, three at a time, and you kind of get a, a regional type area of rep representation, which I think has worked very, very well uh, from my experience. And I know Dr. Stevens was very involved in that uh, on that committee that uh, actually developed, helped develop this, and and it's worked well. Uh, of course, Jessamine County to the south uh, is uh, represented well. Uh, their county, Nicholasville, Wilmore, in the process also. And so I won't say any more about that. It's pretty self-explanatory, and you can see that uh, each council, uh, the council members get together, and they determine who's going to be their representative. And uh, if one can't make it, we usually we can get another one that's well informed of the issues and, and shows up at the policy committee meetings and makes good informed decisions. And in uh, Jessamine County, I think is very happy with the uh, the results. They don't feel like they're getting overrun by Fayette County anymore. So. <laughs> That's a, hmm. Well, we had no choice but to reorganize because uh, the people from Justin County were so dissatisfied with the dysfunctional process we had that they stopped coming. Yes. So I'm happy that they're more, uh, they're happier with this arrangement. Definitely. And uh, we, uh, our staff and our committees uh, go uh, very far in making sure that we hear them and we're going to their task force meetings and their uh, meetings uh, and making sure we're hearing and we're communicating, coordinating, consultating, and uh, considering all their issues. Let's um, go on to the next slide. So uh, the uh, request that was made of us was to look at our uh, man of war study, congestion management study that was finalized in 2007 and rank the low build projects, rank those projects. Uh, and you can see that that, pro that study came out in 2007 and the report listed low build projects uh, which were expected to have a very high impact upon congestion, capacity, and also safety at a relatively low cost. And you all requested this of the staff, not just us, but as Mike was saying, we have a very we're, we're very lucky to have a very coordinated, uh, good working relationship between engineering, traffic engineering, and um, planning, transportation planning, and even streets and roads. We get together very frequently, talk about plans, strategies, studies, processes, and uh, that's a very effective working relationship. We always come to our decisions. I think are made in a very coordinated fashion. And th these projects listed below, um, well, we rank these projects, you'll see on the next page, but I won't jump ahead, that we rank these projects according to the MPO's project ranking criteria. And that is a quite detailed criteria. We have a scoring process, and it considers safety, economic vitality, congestion reduction, public and local official support, and project feasibility among the main criteria. 
and we can share that with you at a later date, for, but it's quite involved. We didn't want to get into the complexities and details of that, but it's very, very detailed, and uh, some of the times we've used it, it's, it's worked very well. We're refining it for our 2035 long-range transportation planning process uh, plan update coming up for next year. So it's a good way uh, to consider everything that needs to be considered in priori prioritizing our projects. And then we bring that to our committees and to the policy committee for the ultimate vetting and decision making of projects. So on the next page, you'll see there are the projects. Uh, there's nine. There was originally seven, but we broke up project six into three separate projects because actually they were three different access management projects. Basically, every one you look at there is a turn lane addition or extension, an operations improvement, or a uh, access management type of project that is very low in cost relatively to these high capital projects, but would go a long way and be very effective in dealing with congestion and safety. Uh, one of the biggest problems on man of war is rear end collisions, which uh, is directly related to speed differential and cars being, you know, falling out of a, or backing up and spilling into the through lane out of a turn lane and you have a car going 45, all of a sudden meeting a car going zero. And uh, this is a big problem in congested areas. But you see, there are the rankings. Uh, and as I said, traffic engineering, engineering, and uh, planning all set down. We had uh, two directors and uh, several engineers and uh, planners uh, in there uh, vetting over the, each project. And I think it turned out in a very logical and prioritized way, um, and that, that's good for our criteria and score and ranking process, I believe. And I did prepare it visually there for you, so you wouldn't have to just look at a list. You can see that uh, project number one is uh, Blazer Parkway. That's one of the highest volume areas, one of the highest turning movement areas. It's a lot of uh, uh, mixed uh, use uh, offices and hospitals and, and uh, of course, through traffic, trying to meet, reach the interstate and the retail area. So it's a very high impact area. You would, you would expect that one to be up in the, in the top. Of course, number two, Richmond Road, uh, extending that right turn lane. And uh, number three, Darby Creek, restricting movements. This goes a long way in safety when you access manage. Number four, for the entire corridor, we do access, or intersection crash countermeasures along Man of War. This would be addition of um, safer, more noticeable signal heads, uh, back pla plates and planes, flashing yellow arrows and signals, and uh, traffic engineering is definitely working on that. Number five, Alumni Drive, uh, channelizing that heavy right turn lane onto Alumni Drive, and as we talked about the last time, that connection between New Circle, Alumni, Man of War, Richmond Road, and uh, the interstate is, is a huge movement during peak hours. Number six, Mount McKinley. We were restricting through movements on that street. That go a long way in preventing right angle type collisions. Uh, number seven, Armstrong Mill, uh, extending the turn bay. Number eight, Clearwater Way, extending the turn bay. And then nine, Jocasta Way, more access management. These projects total up to less than a million dollars. So uh, you can see that they're low hanging fruit, to use that overused term. And uh, also, uh, Mike uh, Webb, he, we took advantage of uh, the current economic stimulus package uh, initiative and submitted each one of these projects uh, in the first round of that. And uh, that's looking pretty good. We're getting emails from, the, from our organizations in state that says that's they're going to uh, looking pretty certain that they're going to approve uh, a certain amount of the proposed uh, money so that's kind of the way we do if we have an opportunity to make sure and jump on it for funding um, and that's basically it as far as the man award projects um, the other item that uh, I think mr. McCord asked for was the status of our SLX monies and 
just wanted to, just for the people at home, SLX is our acronym for Surface Transportation Planning Funds that are allocated to Lexington area on a population formula basis. And as Dr. Stevens said earlier, it's a, it's, we hope for more, but it usually ranges about 3.7 to 4 million average per year. So we really got to use that money efficiently. That's the money that we as an area have total jurisdiction over, total say so over. And um, they have to be, uh, they have to be adjusted to year of expenditure costs. They have to be uh, updated to make sure inflationary as we go out in the years. They also have to be fiscally constrained. We cannot do or fund more projects than what we have estimated coming in. And so uh, those are the two big things I was wanting to get out there. And I'm going to turn, as far as the project levels and the phasing, and uh, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Bob Baird, who's uh, with the Division of Engineering, to explain those to you. Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, Mr. Barrett, we have about uh, five minutes. Yeah. The, the table I'm going to quickly go over is in your packet as well. It shows the uh, proposed allocations from 2009 to 2014. The, what happens over time with the SLX projects is they, the MPO tracks them in the Transportation Improvement Program. The state tracks them in their six-year plan. The two tend to converge. However, the state's six-year plan is not a fiscally constrained plan, as is the MPO's Transportation Improvement Program. So we have to go back from time to time and balance the books. The MPO coordinator at the state asked us to do that, and so we've, we've worked on that, come up with this chart, and just wanted to point out a few things on this with you. The, the boxes where the arrows appear, those are cells where numbers have moved out. The, in the first column, the 2009 column, near the bottom is a row that's titled SLX apportionment. Um, they're showing, as Max mentioned, we typically get 3.7 to $4 million per year in SLX funds. The 4.5 to 4.7 is the figure that the MPO coordinators in, in Frankfurt is asking us to, to use in our programming. So the scheduling that appears here is going to be sensitive to actually receiving 4.5 or $4.7 million. If in reality it turns out to be $4 million, then we adjust again and, and things, things move out. The second thing this is sensitive to is going to be the apportioned match, which is the row underneath the SLX apportionment. It assumes that, that a match of roughly $1.1 million is able to occur to meet the, the state money in the SLX. So that's, uh, that's another thing this is sensitive to. Um, Um, that's about all I wanted to point out. The, as you follow these projects out um, through 2014, beyond 2014, into the future, the, you see at the bottom of the future column, we're still, we still have a ways to go in order to get enough funding to complete the projects just on this list. But if you have any questions on, on this. Thank list, you. Are there any questions? I see none. Thank you very much. And we appreciate Loudon Avenue, too. That's a beautiful project that was accomplished by our government. The uh, Max, did you have any closing comments? No, sir. I'm okay. Thank good. you very much. If there are no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Cine die. Thank you for your leadership. You're